I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Take a show song and hymns. Turn to page 127. 27. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. We're going to sing 1, 2, and 4. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take Him at His word. Just to rest upon His promise. Just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood Jesus, Jesus how I trust him how I prove him more and more Jesus, Jesus precious Oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the song uh, tonight is going to be page 323. Page 323, more about Jesus. We need to know more about Him every day. One, two, and four. Again, more about Jesus what I know. More of His grace to others show. More of His saving full to see. More of His love who died for me. More Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of His saving through the sea, more of His love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn, more of His holy will discern, Spirit of God, my teacher be. Showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of His saving from the sea. More of His love who died for me. More about Jesus on His throne. Riches and glory of His own. More of His kingdom sure increase. More of His coming Prince of Peace. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of His saving fullness see. More of His love who died 
died for me. Yeah. Our last song tonight will be page 451. Where could I go? I don't know. Where could you go but to the Lord? We'll sing all three verses. Where could I go? Living beloved is so simple world. Hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation sore. Where could I go but to the Lord? Where evening we had a, a, um, a good service this morning I think uh, it just seemed like uh, man the, the Lord just knew exactly what we were uh, in need of and then you know always I've always talked about uh, you know it's one thing uh, hoping that the Lord would be in your midst in your services, but it's a whole other thing when when it seems like that that He's not only in the and He not only shows up, but He shows out in the service. And you know, I, I think He showed out a little bit this morning, I think, and uh, we're so proud and uh, privileged for that for sure. Uh, we're here for, for a little bit. We're going to get back into the book of Hosea 
uh, as we continue to look in chapter number 10. Uh, the way that we've been going through chapter 10 is we've kind of been bumping around in the verses, but it, it's, it's a matter of how we're bumping around to how we're going. So, uh, you know, it, it makes sense uh, when we begin to, to look at it in such a manner. Uh, you know, we, we looked and uh, uh, as we get back into, we're in verse 12, and, you know, verse 12 says, Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your foul ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till He come and He rain righteousness upon you. Well, you know, I believe deep down inside me that verse 12 was not only written for the Israelites, for the people of Israel in Hosea's day as he was proclaiming uh, what the Lord had to say to them and as, as the, the, the messenger of the Lord to the people. But, you know, when, when we look at this, I believe this verse is pertinent for today. Uh, we, we've looked and, and we've seen how uh, so much of the book of Hosea as is uh, the Bible itself is not only uh, teaching us of the days of then, but those same things of the days of then are pertinent for today because it seems like uh, every century and every decade uh, in, in time parallels the Bible in some form or fashion. And as we look, I mean, we could sit up here. I mean, I could, I could literally see if we were in need of a prophet. I could literally see the Lord Jesus, if, you, if we go this way, to be standing up and telling the people, or telling us rather, sow to yourselves in righteousness. Read in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till He come and He rain righteousness upon you. You know, we're not to just... We, we get in this and, and as we continue here, you know, just... Uh, we look at the Word there and, and it says, Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till He come. Till He come and rain righteousness upon you. Are we to do it today and, and then sit up and say, Well, that's good enough. Uh, you know, we, 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 we called out to the Lord. We seek the Lord. And uh, we did that. We realized that it's time for us to do these things. But is it, is it just for us to do it one time here or there? No. I mean, it says, till He come and rain righteousness upon you. The Lord wants, He, he wants to see that we are uh, truly committed, truly uh, uh, out on Him. You know, he, he wants us to know that uh, that we are truly serious about Him. And I've, I do believe that when the Lord tends and he, and he realizes and He knows that we are serious about Him, He'll get serious about us. You know, at, at other times, it, you know, I can't see the Lord getting serious about us when, we're, when a person isn't serious about the Lord. Now, sure, he'll, he'll call them and He'll seek them and He may even seek them out. But He's not going to force them to uh, accept Him or to uh, call upon Him to be their Lord and Savior. That's up to the individual. And But boy, the Lord, when He gets serious about uh, a person or a thing or a people, 
you know, there, there's nothing that can stop him. We talked about this morning. I think I made a comment this morning. Sometimes when you get going, you don't really know what you say. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I think I made a comment this morning that there is not a power on this earth that can stop the Lord from raining His blessings down upon us. Nothing. Satan can't stop him. The government can't stop him. Uh, the, the people can't stop him. If the Lord determines that's what He's going to do, He's going to do it. Period. And we look in this. Uh, you know, repentance would set the stage for restored blessing, which God would eventually rain down upon His people. All He wants them to do is turn from the way they were going and turn back to Him. You know, they had left Him. You know, you ever, uh, you ever heard uh, the old antics that you got left high and dry? You know? Well, that's how the, is the, the people of Israel left the Lord. They left Him high and dry. They just, I mean, boy, there wasn't any. I don't know if... I'm sure He did because He's omnipotent and, and He's omniscient. But, uh, you know, it really it makes you wonder sometimes if, if, he, uh, if he realized just that, that they were going to turn against Him. I'm sure He did. But we look at this and, and we must realize that, uh, you know, he, all He wanted for them was for them to turn back to Him. He, he's talking about punishment, the punishment of Israel. All these things that are going to be coming their way. And He will use the Assyrians to do it with. And He will use the Egyptians to do it with. And He will use Rome to do it with in 70 A.D. After, the, after Christ. And, and, but we look in this and all He wants for them is to turn around. Just... Quit following that wrong path and turn around. Man, I have been at, at points, and you know, we talked in Sunday school this morning about uh, giving honor and to the, to our wives and, and those type of things. And I will say that there there are times, or there have been once anyway, that you know we I would get lost. We'd be going somewhere. And I get lost or get turned around. What, however you want to look at, I know where the heck I was going. All right, and you know we're trying to to get there. We're trying to. You ever been someplace you could, you look? I mean, I could read a map. You know, read a map. And you're saying, okay, yeah, it goes this way. It gets, and in this town, it's going to turn off out, out here someplace. And and so you know, you get up there and you get to the town and. Now you gotta look for this, you know, and, and boy, you're looking, driving people honking at you because you know you're trying to go slow so you don't miss nothing. And you get going through town and you just, you know, you end up just keep going right on out of town, you're going, did I miss it? Or what? And you know, sometimes all I would really need to do is what? Just turn around go back the other way. But I'm like, oh, well, you know, we'll go on down here a ways, and then that ways is a little bit more, and then it, it goes a little bit more, and before you know it, you're, you're way out there, you know, and if you turn back now, I mean, that's just really wasting you, so now you've got to figure out some other way how to cut over, or something like that. Uh, but you know, all the Lord wanted them to do is turn around. He wanted them to just turn around before it got too late. That's all he, he required of them is to just turn around. But they didn't. You know, they, they should confess and repent until the Lord sent the blessings of righteousness upon them. Just like rain. Uh, to reap blessing and goodness, you must sow blessing and goodness. Because you reap what you sow. I mean, the average farmer today, you can go out and, and it's and it's about time. I mean, the fields should be already starting to come up. 
I mean, you know, those in East Texas that plant sweet corn, you know, I mean, it, it's pretty much, you should done had the fields plowed and done planted and everything else and putting insecticide out or whatever you're doing, you know, getting everything ready for those, for that corn to come up. But, you know, you don't sit up here and I'm going to plant corn. I'm going to have a corn crop. All right, you make your plans. You say, okay, so you keep checking the market, you know, see what it's bringing and, and all this stuff. You know, whether it's uh, corn fit for man to eat or whether it's it ends up being feed corn. And so you're sitting up here and you do all this stuff and then all of a sudden when the crop come up, you got... Uh, Trying to think of something that looks like corn, but I can't think of anything. Uh, you got instead of corn, you got cotton come up, right? And you're like, what in the world? Well, I know. I'm using this as an example. The point is, if you're gonna if you're gonna have a crop of corn, what do you do? You plant corn. Right? Well, and you wouldn't plant potatoes and then be doing nothing but researching the corn market to see how much corn is bringing. And then all of a sudden, you know, you got those stalks and you're like, wait a minute. You wouldn't do those things. No. You, if you were looking for corn, you plant corn, you, you prepare your fields for corn, you spray for corn, you, you do all the stuff that you need to do, hoping that you're going to have a corn crop, that you get timely rains and all that stuff. I mean, that's just the way it is. Well, it's the same here. For you reap what you sow. If you sow discord and you sow uh, uh, where you, you, you turned your back on the Lord and you started following... Uh, foreign peoples and idol gods and, and all this other stuff, well, that's what you're going to reap. Or that's what you're going to sow because that's what you reap. The Lord wanted them before they made it too big a mistake in their lives. They've already made big enough here. All He wanted them to do is turn back so that now they could, they could turn back to the Lord and realize, hey, boy, I've been going the wrong way all this time. Hey, I planted the wrong seeds in my field. Hey, I needed to reap or to sow what I've reaped. And if I'm going to sow the love of God for Him to rain righteousness down upon me, then I've got to be sowing love and dedication, commitment, and all these things unto the Lord. He's going to do His part. No doubt. But the trouble is, the people of Israel, they didn't do their part. They were, they were sowing something else. And now they're reaping the misfortunes of what they sowed. Just as plowing is hard work, so it would be hard for the people to change their lifestyle. But they must do so. You know, only by searching for the Lord and His righteousness would they be delivered from the coming punishment. Now, He's been trying to tell them why He's punishing them. Why punishment is going to come. How come He's treating them this way and things. And it's not because He's just... He woke, God woke up one morning and said, well, you know, I think I'm just going to take my uh, the people of Israel and I'm just going to treat them like dirt today. No. It's because of what they were reaping or what they were sowing. They were sowing discord. They were sowing uh, idol worship. They were sowing all of these things that went against God.
You know, God's people were to sow righteousness. And then they would reap kindness and blessings in return. Hosea said, sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till He come and He rain righteousness upon you. The very first admonition is sowing righteousness. In order for them to, to have Him, to have the Lord rain righteousness upon them, they needed to sow righteousness. And they didn't. You know, con, uh, cons- this first uh, admonition, this sowing of righteousness, it, 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 it was a concern. It concerned the relation of people to people. And the second, it says, uh, uh, "Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy." That that's searching for God, the the relation of people to God. And if they failed to do this. There would be no hope of deliverance. And I mean, I mean, you know, they're not. God's just not going to. Uh, he's a jealous God for one thing, but He's not just going to to come and give them what they don't deserve. You look at us, for instance. We take for what Jesus did on the cross at Calvary, and by what He did on Calvary, now we're not reaping what we deserve. Which is dead. We we come unto spiritual death. A person comes unto spiritual death because that's what they sow is spiritual death. And and one way, at one day or another, they're gonna reap it unless they turn back and turn unto the Lord. You know, if, if we don't cultivate our heart and break up our fallow ground, Satan will cultivate it for you. The soil of your heart will have something growing in it for sure, whether it's good or bad. I mean, what, what grows in your heart is, is going to be of God or not. There's not any, there's not no in betweens in there. It's either of Him or it isn't. And that's the way if, if the soil of our heart, it will, it, it, it'll, it, I mean, it's either going to grow good or bad. Now, the world would love to believe that there's a middle ground in there somewhere, but there's not. You know, if you bring no crop to God, the devil will be sure to reap a harvest in your life. This is what John the Baptist was trying to get across to the people that he preached to. People thought he was a lunatic. They thought he was a crazy person. Thought he was a a, a wild a wild man living out in there wearing skins and eating. Uh, uh, Locusts and wild honey, you know. But he was the forerunner of Jesus. He was the one that was sent here to point to the Lamb. To present the Lamb to the people. And as he did these things, he, he surely was trying to get across to the people. They needed to repent and bring forth the results, the fruits that come from repentance. Matthew 3, verse 8, it says, Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. Repentance and sowing righteousness brings forth blessings. I mean, it's a cause and effect situation. If you sow bitterness and hatefulness and discord and, and 
uh, the love of the world instead of the love of God, then that is what you're going to get. But if you'll sow repentance and faith and seek God's mercy and His forgiveness, then you'll reap the very blessings of righteousness in your life and in eternity. Proverbs 11.18 says, The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 1. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. What about uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. But this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, but he which soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. You can... You can plant, you can prepare a whole field. Chill it up, furrow it out, and plant two rows of corn right down the middle of the field. And you should expect that you're going to have two rows of corn when harvest comes. You should not expect because you've planted two rows right down the middle of the field that you're going to have a whole field of corn. It don't work that way. You know? So that that you reap is what you're going to sow for sure. If you sow it bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. If, if we sow a little bit for the Lord, then we're going to reap a little bit for the Lord. But if we sow a lot for the Lord, our, our words, our actions, our, the things we do and, and all that, then we're going to reap bountifully for the Lord. That's the kind of God we serve. Uh, Psalm 33, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom He hath chosen for His own inheritance. Now you know there there are people. I mean, uh, you know, we we talk about uh, being a chosen people, being a peculiar people, Christians. You know, but we have to realize that that as we do these things. Uh, not everybody is going to inherit because not everybody has turned their heart to the Lord. Only those that turn their heart to the Lord are going to reap His eternal blessings. And that's our blessed hope. I mean, for sure. I, I, you know, I, I can't speak for anybody else. I can speak for me. Man, I'm looking for the day when hey I'm either when I'm either going to be I'm going to be in one or two groups for sure you know so I mean that kind of narrows it down a little bit I'm going to be in I'm going to be in the group where the dead in Christ shall rise first or the ones that are alive are going to fall after now I'm going to be in one of them two groups and I'm positive about that I'm going to be in one of them. But not everybody is going to be in those groups. Or in one of them groups. Anyway. There are going to be those that were given opportunities. When the Gospel was preached, the, 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 the message of Jesus and His redemption on the cross at Calvary, when those messages pricked the hearts of individuals and the opportunity was given and they still sit. Never respond. I got plenty of time. No. 
we don't have plenty of time to wait because none of us know how much time we got. Might have another, let's see. I'm 60. I might have another 10 or 15 years, maybe. And I might not. I might have another 40 years. And I hope not. I'd rather go early than late, let me tell you. Because <laughs> that, just, that just puts me here longer, you know. But as long as we're doing the Lord's work, that's what matters, ain't it? I mean, we can turn around and just do it. Now, I ain't asking nobody to hurry me along anywhere. You know? That's like people, that's like people they'll turn around and they'll say, well, you know, uh, uh, I lost my train of thought now. Old age. Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, Proverbs 14, verse 34. Good grief. Righteousness exalteth a nation. Uh oh. But sin is a reproach to any people. If righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Boy, I, you know, it just it makes you cause and think, you know, where are we in that as a nation? But you know, the, these these folks, they they turn around, they they had to deal with the consequences of hard-heartedness. Go up to verse 2. It says, uh, Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spell their images. You know, the, the very conviction of guilt and crashing destruction of perhaps their dreams and their hopes. And it's, and it's brought about because of their heart. It's not because that uh, God woke up on the wrong side of, of heaven one day. But it was because of their actions. You know, the hardness of God's people made them guilty before God. Their hard hearts made them guilty before God. They would reap the consequences of a guilty verdict. They which replace the Lord in their lives would be removed and destroyed by the Lord. God does not like to be second best to anything. If his own people began to place more importance on things other than him, he will remove those things. He will break down their altars and will spoil their images. Now, if they want to turn around here, they want to praise the foreign God, they want to uh, idol worship and all these things and turn their back on God. You know, God basically in, in His heart, in His mind says, fine. I'll just break down those altars. I'll break down those gods. I'll break down those things. And you won't have it to worship. Exodus 20, verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Psalm 146, verse 9, The Lord, hath pre the Lord, hath, the Lord preserveth the strangers. He reliveth the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. Job 5 and verse 12. He disappointeth the devices of the crafty, 
so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. Isaiah 41, verse 11, Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing. They that strive with thee shall perish. Whew. I mean, God ain't cutting no slack here. You know, Isaiah 45, verse 16, They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. You know, when, when, when God comes in, He's going to put that conviction of guilt and uh, He'll bring utter destruction to those things that people have placed before Him. But you know, there are still those folks. We find the people of Israel right here as a nation now. They've, they, they've seen God do these things and yet they still turn their backs on Him. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine a nation that has reaped God's blessings for so long and yet it seems like have literally turned their backs upon Him. And that's what this nation has done. We find uh, not only the conviction of guilt and the, and the crashing destruction of dreams, but we find the conflict. Look at verse 4. It says, They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a covenant. Thus judgment springeth up as hemlock in the furrows of the field. Go to verse 14. Therefore shall a torment arise among thy people, and all thy fortresses shall be spoiled, as Shaman spoiled Beth Arbel in the day of battle. The mother was dashed into pieces upon her children. Man, when we look at these things, we learn the unconcerned cheating and deception of people lead to legal disputes. These disputes would sprout up like poisonous weeds in the furrows of a plowed field. You know, when, when it, it, the greed of people today, we look, we look at it today because we, we really don't know then, but we can look at it today and, and these type of things have flooded our courtrooms with an abundance of trivial cases. You ever watch uh, Judge uh, those, those reality shows? You know they would they'll come in and they'll let some TV judge, you know, or, or judge that's on a, their TV show make a ruling in their case instead of them going to court, and they have to accept it. You know, both cases they have to accept it if they're doing it. But we've turned around and. And man, there are a lot of those type of uh, uh, programs on TV today. And man, you'll sit and you'll watch some of these things, and you listen to some of this stuff, and and just wonder if you'd have gone to a real courtroom and filed a real civil suit and waited two years to get to court and presented this garbage that you're presenting here before this TV judge, you'd be laughed out of the courtroom. And boy, they'll just turn around. I've seen those things and laugh at some of the things that are going on. Well, you know, we look and when we tend to do these things, the same is actually happening today. The same happened in, this, in their day. You know, they had legal disputes and they had ways that they, that they conducted that they uh, decided upon them. And yet, 
boy, we could turn around and there would be so much that uh, that they uh, they wouldn't even be able to do it. It'd just be so trivial, trivial of stuff, you know. And my goodness, problems would also arrive arise in the service in the area of conflicts with other nations. You know, we find that Israel, they they would make uh, they made alliances with other nations, and then they turned to their enemies, the Assyrians, and they turned to their enemies, the Egyptians, and they got themselves in the middle of a bunch of people that all of them hated them. You know, nobody really cared for them. The people they aligned themselves with, they could give a squat about what Israel did, but um, as long as Israel kept property and kept paying and they got their part or whatever, they could care less. What happened to Israel? But God cared. And He's trying to get that point across to them. But they're not listening very well. You know, these problems with other nations, uh, uh, Shalman, uh, we can may refer, it, it could refer to King uh, Shalmanizer III and Assyria who conducted campaigns in the West in the 9th century B.C. Another identification of Shalman is King Shalmanu, a Moabite ruler who was a contemporary uh, of King uh, Hosea of Israel and whose name appears in a list of kings who paid tribute to the Assyrian king uh, Tiglat Pilzer III. You know, a third possibility is the Assyrian king Shalmanizer the, the fifth who prepared the way for Israel's captivity by invading the land. Here in the verses, Beth Arbel could refer to the town of Arbella about 18 miles southwest of the Sea of Galilee or uh, to Mount Arbel two miles west of the Sea of Galilee. Any case, I mean, it really doesn't matter what it was referred to, but the battle had been a bloody one. And the Israelites in Hosea's day remembered vividly. The enemy had slaughtered mothers and their children without mercy. They cut the mothers to pieces and would slaughter the children. One of the causes of a hard heart and conflict all stems from one thing. Pride. They were prideful people. The, 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 the nation of Israel was a prideful people. And they, uh, they, they didn't realize that pride leads to conflict and division with others. Proverbs 13 and 10 says, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. Proverbs 22, verse 10. Cast out the scorner, the contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. You know, if a nation will humble itself before God, and if that nation will get right with the Lord, God will bless the nation and give it peace and prosperity. We've had that as a nation for a long time. But slowly but surely, we're drifting away from those things of God as a nation now. And accepting the idol gods of the world. We find fear 
Look at verse 5. It says, The inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of beth For the people thereof shall mourn over it, and the priests thereof that rejoiced on it for the glory thereof, because it is departed from it. And it shall be also carried unto Assyria for a present to King Jerob. I mean, we look and as we do and we realize this term, the calves of beth <coughs> it denotes the wickedness and the helplessness of these idols. The word for calves is in the feminine gender in order to express contempt for those idols which Jeroboam set up. So we find that the Hebrews, they ignored the existence of female uh, divinities. Their names for the Lord are all masculine names. The feminine form may also imply their weakness in strength. Being so far from their idols and being unable to help them, these stubborn and rebellious people would be anxious, worried, or troubled for their idols. so worried about you. How dumb is that? If this is their idol, man-made at that, all idols are man-made, can you imagine sitting up here worrying about a man-made idol that by all by all reasons, you could just make another. If it failed, you got worried about it, perhaps it got defeated, it, 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 it turned out, you know, it didn't do anything for you. Okay. You're gone. Well, let's make another. And they and they 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 put it up and they put it before the Lord God of Israel. And God says, Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you. Why? Do you not understand? They feared that they would be taken from them. Instead of feeling safe under the protection of a golden God made by hand, the people would tremble for the safety of the gods themselves. How dumb is that? If it was a real God... Why would I have to tremble for the God? If the God is so powerful, if the God is supreme, if the God is, is what He says He is, why would I tremble for Him? Why should I tremble for Him? God's trying to tell them when He talks to them about these, these calves of beth Haven, He's telling them, you know, why are you trembling for your man-made idol gods? If they're so powerful, if they're so big, they're so mighty, they ought to take care of you. Just like I can. If you go into battle under their name, they ought to be able, if it's what that God actually wanted you to do, He should provide you with a victory. Just like I did for Joshua. 
each and every time. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. But the men of Israel fear not the Lord. That was the problem. And their punishment was to fear because of the calves, of their idol gods, of those other things. They were more focused upon their idols than upon their sin that was harming their relationship with the one and the only true living God. They were so concerned with their idols, they could they 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 just looked over their sin. Instead of conquering their sin and looking back to God. Their priorities were all distorted. But this is what happens when your heart gets cold and hard towards God. The change in name of the place of worship is an indication of what had taken place in their lives. The Bethel, the house of God, of the patriarch Jacob, was now turned into beth Aven, the house of vanity or wickedness. beth Aven had become a place of sin and corruption instead of a place of holiness and divine mercy and grace. The priests mentioned here have a particular name they were called uh, uh, Kamarim from Kamar. And it, and it literally means to be black and, and not by their uh, ethnicity, but by what they wore. From the black garments in which they ministered. They were distinguished as ministers of a foreign cult. For Cohen is the usual word for a Hebrew priest and his robe of office is said to have been white because they sought their happiness and serenity from their calf idols. They were insecure and fearful for their gods because they could be taken away from them. What would it be like if we stopped just for a moment and we stopped and we looked at the Lord Jesus and realized that He could be taken from us? Think of what that would be like. I mean, we, there, there's not a power on this earth that could do it. There's not a power in anything that could do that. But just for instance, what if He could be taken from us? See, that's the one thing that the Lord God of Israel had over these idol gods. These could be taken. People could come in they take over, they come into the temple or wherever the, you know, that their God was, and they could snatch it away from them. But you know, there's not a power anywhere that can snatch our Lord from within our hearts unless we allow to take place. 
And we can do that. It's called backsliding. It's called just turning your back on God. It's what Israel did. They, they allowed their hearts to be open to new gods, to new things, instead of being steady for the Lord God of Israel. We look, they, they just, uh, they had sought their happiness and security from their calf idols. They were insecure, fearful for their gods because they could be taken from them. It was a common practice of the Assyrians to steal the idols of their enemies to prove their power and dominance over their enemies. I mean, if I could come in and could snatch your God from you. What does that show about you and your God? It shows that I'm more powerful than Him. I'm more powerful than you. And you can't do a thing about it. That's what it proves. I don't know why I keep picking them up and setting them back down. I'll just set them up here. You know, it, they were like trophies to the king of, of Assyria. You know, we on my wall at home, I've got several uh, antler mounts of deer that I've, I've shot. i got one big taxidermist head of a big buck that I shot. And... And I look, and, and you know, I look at them things, and I'm like, wow, you know, uh, that, that's a, a, a trophy for me. It, it means an accomplishment. It, it, gives, it, it gives me, I can look back, and I can think about the hunt, and I can think about the shot, and I can think about all those things. And, and it's a trophy. You got the Super Bowl. You got the... Um, the World Series. You got Stanley Cup in hockey. Um, I don't know what the basketball is. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what the basketball trophy is for whatever they win. Well, I know that part, but it's got to have some kind of name, you know. Uh, but anyway, you know, I, I I look at these things and I'm like, well, you know, I just don't. Uh, those are, are nothing but something that you look back and you say, on this day and this year and this given time, we were the best. And we were better and, than anybody else. That's what they would do, Assyria would do to nations. They would come in and they would just snatch their gods, mount them up on the wall, and say, and then think back and say, wow, I remember that. And I remember when we went over there and we just snatched that God right off there, right out of their temple, and they just stood there. Man, we were so powerful that day. And that's the type of the thing that they would do. When their idols were stolen, Israel did mourn over her loss. And calf worship ended in Israel. The word mourn means to twist or to whirl oneself. And it is applied to any violent emotion, generally of joy, but also of anxiety and fear. The latter application is the meaning in this verse. They frantically trembled in fear for their gods that there was coming somebody that was going to snatch it away. And then they would either be taken into bondage or they weren't taken into bondage. They just have to work and pay tribute to the foreigners that snatched their god away. Instead, God would rather have had them to come back to Him 
knowing that nobody can snatch him out of our heart. Nobody can snatch him out of my spirit, out of my soul. They might kill me. They may take my home. They may take my money. They may take my uh, donkey, sheep, cat, whatever it is. But they ain't. They can't take my God out of my heart. But they didn't think that. Instead, all they did was just think about how it was going to be. How it was going to happen. And yet, it was them that aligned themselves with these foreign peoples. It was them that aligned themselves under these foreign idol kings. It was them that aligned themselves even to the Assyrians that will eventually come and dominate them. It wasn't God. It was them. Their biggest fault was them and their pride. So anyway, <clears throat> if, uh, if anybody missed... Uh, this morning, I hope that uh, they'll they'll look at the morning service on YouTube. There, um, we had a, a good service this morning, and uh, it seemed like the the Lord not only showed up but showed out. And boy, we're so thankful for that. Even so, um, if you happen to be watching out there, I hope that you'll you'll look and you'll watch not only this but you'll watch this morning's as well. And we're going to finish, we're going to pick up next week where we left off this week in, in the morning because we only got so far. Uh, so uh, I hope and pray that uh, as we end out the month of April here this week that uh, we'll realize that time is just clicking by. And sooner or later, our day is going to come. So let's pray and, and we'll be dismissed this evening. Lord, we, we do come thanking You, Lord, so much for Your many blessings. Lord, we praise and we honor Your holy name. Lord, I, I pray that You would help us not only as individuals and not only as a church, but Lord, also as a nation, Lord, that we would get our priorities in order and right. Lord, we, we just we lift up to You, Lord. And Lord, I, I pray that, that we'll open our hearts to You, Lord. That You would rain down righteousness and blessings upon us, Lord, as only You can. Lord, we love You. We thank You. Just uh, be with us. Take us safely from this place this evening, Lord. Keep us safe till we reach our destinations as we leave. And Lord, that You bring us back once again this Wednesday evening, Lord, as we continue uh, in, in Your Word in the book of Hosea. Lord, we love You. We thank You. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.